Summer Singers is on Thursdays through August 22nd in the evenings. Um, practice is at the Methodist Church, and the concert is on August 25th at 3 p.m. Everyone is welcome to join. Um, the youth are still collecting bottle caps, um, so if you'd like to do that, uh, please bring those in. And then the flowers under the cross uh, are in memory of Kathy Bachman. The flowers came from the Boca shop and were donated by Teddy. Um, if you are with us uh, here today in person, please take a moment and sign the friendship pack at the center of the aisle. Are there any other announcements? Good morning. Um, I just wanted to report on our sweet corn sales that the, the ladies of the church did. Uh, that was about a week and a half ago, and uh, we want to thank Bruce for donating the corn and everything we did to help us get the corn to the sales spot. We made $1,029. So, 
had low toward emission items. There's kind of a uh, Thursday we won't be pra practicing at the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. We're going to be at the Apple Park at the direction of the Okay. And there's about 10 of us from this church in the summer camp. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then the concert's at 3 at the Methodist Church. Doesn't cost anything. Mm -hmm. oh. Friday, the lunch will be at the golf club at 11 30. Um, and everybody is invited. I just need to know, either myself or Judy needs to know how many plan to come Friday to the golf club at 11.30. Okay. Um, if there are no other announcements, please join me in worshiping our Lord. If God is for us, who is against us? God who gave us the Son, now gives us the spirit and power. The Holy One is in our midst, equipping us for life in the service of Christ. <clears throat> in Christ we are more than conquerors, for nothing in creation can separate us from the love of God. May we all surpass the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the unshakable love of God, and the joyous communion of the Holy Spirit, you. Let us worship God together. If you're able, please stand and turn your hymnals to number 476, O Worship the King, All Glorious Above. <laughs> Thank you. 
peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please pass the peace of Christ to one another. sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dreamy by night. And God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind, to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life, or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. 
I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. The word of the Lord. this box? A can of what? Tomato sauce. Do have some tomato sauce for It might be. Noodles. Spaghetti. Spaghetti. Oh, these are making hungry. Uh, this is, this is so there could be many different things. Okay. Super Mario. Wow. Yeah, this is getting great. Uh, now, so why are you guessing those things uh, that might be in this box? That, uh, because it's super biological, yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, now, why do you think that it's so hard to guess what's inside the box? Because you can't see it. Right, oh, that's exactly. Uh, so in today's story, we will hear about an apostle. An apostle is somebody who has learned from Jesus and then teaches others what they have learned from Jesus. And this apostle, Paul, is in Athens, uh, Greece, in today's story. Now, while he's there, he sees this monument like a statue. And it says, to the unknown God. Now, what that means is that the Greeks were honoring any God who existed, but they didn't know about yet. Okay, so Paul uses their curiosity and respect about the unknown to tell them about the God we know. And the God who created everything that we know. The God who gave life to all that's living. So Paul tells them that we are sons and daughters of this God and that we belong to God. God cares about us and about what we do. So a little bit later in the story, we hear that some of the Greeks laughed at what Paul had said and didn't believe him. Other Greeks said, we'd like to talk to you some more about this God. And most importantly, there were some Greeks who believed what Paul said. So it's like some of the Greeks chose to receive a gift from Paul, but actually it's more like Paul unwrapped the gift so that the people in Athens could see what's inside of it. So Paul unwrapped the gift. It's not too good. <laughs> so it's, it's the candy, yes. <laughs> and there were new things for the people to learn about and receive that they could then share with others. So if, as you look inside this gift box, let's see if there's something for you to receive and share with others. So here's this candy. All right. Now, why that isn't new information, it's definitely something we can receive and share with others. So after we pray, we're going to do that. Uh, let's have each of you take a piece for yourself, and then take some pieces to share and pass as you head on out. So people on down, maybe they want some candy too. And if they don't, they can just put it back on the seat or whatever. <laughs> uh, and as we do that, let's remember the good news of today's story. In the same way Paul helped the Greeks in Athens know more about God, we too can help others know about God, even better than we do. So let's pray. Uh, dear God, thank you that learning about you is like receiving a gift that we can then share with those around us. Thank you, and amen. All right. Make sure you find for somebody else. lesson comes from Acts chapter 17, and actually from verses 16 through 34, that was my fault, I sent those, uh, but 16 through 34. And this is Paul in Athens. 
While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the area of Pegasus and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, and so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given an assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed, but others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Now, archaeology can be fascinating to read about. Whether it is in the pictures and the pages of the National Geographic, which I grew up with around the house when I was young, or in books or on websites, especially since I don't have the opportunity to visit interesting places in person like that. I've read about the site, an ancient, an ancient site uh, uh, called Petra, maybe you've heard of it. It's located in Jordan and has a rich and diverse ancient lineage. For the long stretch of time, it was the home of the Nabataean people, who were known for merchants and traders in a place that was at the crossroads of the Near East. They eventually integrated into their culture, architecture, and religion, Greek, Roman, and Arab traditions. If you have only ever seen one image from Petra, it is likely that the facade called the treasury, uh, facade called the treasury, featured in the final scenes of the movie Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's a lot of fun. But standing in for an imagined ancient temple protecting the Holy Grail, to reach the treasury, one walks down the entrance to the city called uh, Sikh, S-I-Q, a path that is three quarters of a mile long but only about 10 yards wide, surrounded on both sides by stone mountains about 100 yards tall. I read about that walk to the site. A guide will point out smallish niches carved into those high points. And those are where they will tell a, a Nabataean quote, God idol would have sat so, so that the travelers could make offerings to them as they entered the city. Of course, the idol itself was no longer in its place. Now there is a museum next to the site, where a lot of those ancient relics are on display. Uh, Nabataean God idol will take your breath away, and not on account of its beauty. It can best be described as a stone rectangle with some decorative carving on the edges, but then a flat center where it looks like someone might have glued on two eyes, a rudimentary nose, and a mouth. It is what I would have been able to craft had you simply given me a slab of clay and parts from a Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> Flat is the only way to describe it in both its form and its effect. Now, I wonder if it, if it wasn't God like this that the psalmist criticizes in Psalm 115 and elsewhere, where it says that they are idols with mouths that do not speak, eyes that do not see, and ears that do not hear. 
They were nothing in comparison to the God of Israel who dwells in the heavens, steadfast in love and faithfulness, active and powerful. The psalmist goes so far as to compare the one-dimensional nature of the idol to the faulty character and faith of the idol makers. Now, of course, these Nabataean gods are also nothing compared to the statues and idols Paul encountered on his visit to and walk around Athens. Another religiously and intellectually diverse meeting place of the ancient world. These idols are so renowned in their beauty that thousands of years later, you meet on a modern day, they have some of the places of highest honor in our meetings. But it is a more simple and unassuming idol that Paul wants to speak to the Athenians about in our text this morning. Paul looks around and sees that the Athenians, uh, that Athens is covered in idols. That is a word that sounds so out of date as we keep talking about it. American idol is a thing, of course, but outside of that, we don't have statue idols. It's a, a word from another time, like using, unfortunately, cassette tapes, or navigating your way on a, a paper map, you can still do it, uh, or getting your child the name Percival, I'm so sorry, it's out there. Uh, nobody does this anymore. A story about idols seems irrelevant, but it's worth a second look. There's a reason why it's in the Bible. We learn that Paul was not taken with the beauty of the Greek gods and, in fact, is distressed at how many of them he encounters. In response, he spends most of his time in debate with both the faithful and the agnostic, the willing and the unwilling, sharing with them the good news of salvation, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Athenians, exhausted by his babbling as they describe it to one another, ask him to come to the center of the city, the Areopagus, where people would gather to discuss new ideas, to better explain to them what in the world was going on about. They want to know about this new religion he's talking about. Now in Athens, they love talking about the newest idea. Like some folks need to have the newest iPhone or watch the newest movie. In Athens, they wanted to talk about the newest idea. Folks said Paul could tell them about a new God. They wanted to hear more. But don't assume that they held him in high esteem. They were there to challenge him as much as anything. And nothing would be so rewarding than if they heard Paul out and shown to be a fool. If you are the kind who likes to argue for sport, you would have loved ancient Athens. Now, once Paul is in this honored public forum, he tries a completely different approach. He praises their religiosity, references their own faithfulness to the unknown God, and then goes on to speak of the expansiveness and authority of the creator of the universe. He reminds them that each of them, all human beings, are created to desire and experience and know God. He then offers to the Athenians what for him has become a profound and life-transforming way to know this unknown God, the knowledge of and experience of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. New Testament scholar Bridget Green has reflected on Paul's shift in his evangelistic movement at this moment. She says, Paul's approach in proclaiming the gospel to the Athenians is a testament to God's expansive plan. With an ethnographer's curiosity, he strives to connect with the community he visits, even in spaces of discomfort. Without condescension or berating, he uses a rhetorical strategy that resonates with his audience and respects their culture. Despite disagreeing with what he observes, he is neither dismissive nor patronizing. In his observation of something that was born to him, Paul discovers a purpose in the altar to an unknown God that enriches his anthropology and his theology. He is open to the transforming power of God's work in and through him while he labors in planting a word. Paul demonstrates God's generosity in the gifts of the gospel and the Holy Spirit. These gifts are accessible to all who seek God in the teachings of Jesus. They are for those who encounter the good news through the testimony and lived examples of believers. Paul invites the Athenians to contemplate their own experience of the divine, varied as they likely were, and invites them to consider his own personal testimony, his own personal experience of God through Jesus. Yes, Paul preaches about the unknown God, but his primary message is that this very same God wants to be known and is knowable by his creation. What Paul rightly sees in Athens is a conversation about what human beings are for. What's our purpose? Do we have a purpose? This is not a question that is limited to philosophers. It's a question that emerges, emerges in adolescence as we begin to gain a sense of the size of the world and our own insignificance. Do I matter? More than a few citizens of Athens believe that human life holds no ultimate purpose. Many argue the same today. 
They say, we are accidents of birth with no real meaning or calling. Archaeologists have discovered a common inscription on graves in ancient Athens that reads, I was not, I was, I am not, I do not care. Ugh. That is to say, I existed for a while, but it was meaningless. I can't care if life had no purpose. This may be a reason Athens was filled with gods. They were searching for something. The practice of idolatry, the creation of statues or other objects of worship, I don't know anybody who does that anymore, but I do think that the internal mental process that led to idolatry is as relevant today as ever. Think about this. Why would someone create an idol to, or create an object to worship? The only reason anyone would create a God is to have that God take care of you, to protect you, or to make you prosperous. No one created an idol that would expect something of you, or demand anything of you. The idol seems like a God, but it's all about you. What Jesus revealed in his ministry is that it's small to think of God as existing to serve us. We exist to serve God. We're part of something much bigger than ourselves. We're, our lives are not meaningless because we serve the Lord of heaven and earth. They took Paul to the area of Pius and said, okay, you have no idea, let's hear it. They were interested, but we should not confuse interest with openness. They were primarily there to argue with him, to point out how his philosophy doesn't hold up to show how Paul is a fool. When Paul looks around and sees that city filled with idols, he sees a spiritual search. He sees that the understanding of God is contested. And that sounds pretty contemporary to me. Then he sees that the statue from the of God, he says, I see you speak of a God you do not know. Let me tell you about a God I do know. And Paul tells him that unlike their idols, God is not someone we create, but rather God created us. God created all of us. So the spiritual questions we have are shared questions. He tells them that we all descend from a set of original parents in a way of saying that we are all one family. He tells them that God has sent his son Jesus, who was raised from the dead, and some folks think he is crazy. A few believe and follow him, and others say, we will hear you again about this. Now, when Paul describes Jesus, Paul doesn't describe him as one who comes in love, or one who teaches, or as one who heals, or as one who lifts up the lowly and oppressed. No, not any of this. In this instance, Paul says, Jesus comes to judge us all. That's it. He, he comes to judge. Now, what would make folks say, hmm, I want to hear more about this Jesus who comes to judge? Mm -hmm. They clearly heard this Jesus of judgment as good news somehow. But how? Now, if I say judgment, you know that I have a naked image. The uh, church and judgment don't have a great track record. I read about Michael Cervetus. Cervetus. He was a Spanish scientist and Renaissance man. He was the first European to explain how lungs pass oxygen to the bloodstream. He was also a man of deep faith. He was a contemporary of John Calvin, father of Presbyterian faith. Servetus did not believe in the Trinity, so there were consequences. Both the Catholic and Protestant churches branded him a heretic, so he required judgment. Under John Calvin's leadership, Servetus was burned at the stake. Now, Calvin thought this was too harsh. He thought service, service should be extended mercy and simply shot. But the council overruled Calvin and he was burned at the stake. So the church has made some progress. We don't do that anymore. But too many have experienced the judgment of the church, not as grace, but as pain. Women can speak to that. The poor can speak to that. Various and many communities we all know about can speak to that. There are many who have found the way to churches in our world, bringing with them memories of having been condemned by the church. Such injuries are not easy to set aside. So why did people want to hear Paul talk about judgment? If I understand it, the judgment of which Paul speaks is different from what I have been describing. Now, one woman said that her daughter, after a difficult incident in their home, of which the mom has said that there are many, I believe her, was sitting under the table, his daughter was in a huff, and she simply said, I don't like consequences. No, I get that. So there are two kinds of consequences. There are the consequences that are imposed, and there are the consequences that simply result. The consequences that are imposed are the go-to-your-room consequences. You did something, you got caught. Punishment is imposed. I think uh, most folks think of judgment like that. It's imposed. You get caught, you go to your room. But the judgment of God is more like the consequences that result. 
If I only eat ice cream and the only exercise I get is working the ice cream scoop, my health declines. It happens. If I'm never kind and always grumpy, my relationships suffer. If I, do, if I do not study for my exams, we'll just start it, my grade suffers. It happens. My teacher is my judge. Now here's the thing. My teacher does not impose my grade on me. I make my own grade. My teacher reveals the truth of my grade. The judgment is not imposed. It results from my choices. Now, if I understand the text, what Paul sees in Jesus is a holy teacher who reveals to us the meaning of human life reveals what the purpose of human living is. And when we look at him, we discover how he loves. How he loves not only those who love him, but how he loves the least and the lost, the broken and the bruised, the prisoner and the oppressed. When we see how he loves, we see that there is a gap between how he loves and how we love. And that is judgment, not opposed, it's results. I think that's why folks want to hear more. Because discovering the truth about yourself is never easy. Unless you already know that you do not have the answers. And you are hungry to know what your life is for. If we already know that the, the world is not right, that we have not completely matured, that something is missing and you care, then finding a teacher who can show the way is welcome. Judy Bloom's best-selling and often banned 1970 young adult novel, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret was released as a new film last year. The movie and the book tell the, the fictional story of 11-year-old Margaret who is navigating a move from New York to New Jersey, the pitfalls of finding, making, and keeping friends, the tensions between her Jewish grandmother and her Christian grandparents, the inevitable conflict this creates between her parents and her own internal changes as she enters puberty. In the midst of all these confusing changes, despite having never been introduced to religious practice by her parents, have chosen altogether to avoid the topic, telling Margaret that religion is something that she can work out on her own when she's an adult. Margaret turns to God in prayer, and she puts herself on her own journey of discovery of God amongst the diverse expressions of religion that have uh, a touch point in her life. She starts each prayer the same way. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. This one prayer, she says. I'm going to temple today with Grandma. It's a holiday. I guess you know that. Well, my father thinks it's a mistake, and my mother thinks the whole idea is crazy, but I'm going anyway. I'm sure this will help me decide what to be. I've never been inside a temple or church. I'll look for you, God. The new movie's writer-director, Kelly Freeman Craig, shared she took particular care with Margaret's spiritual quest. It was the most delicate part of the story, she said, reaching at a young, tumultuous age something greater beyond yourself in an effort to figure out if somebody is making sure you're okay. She, would, she went on. I think I was that age when I started to ask those larger existential questions. And I feel like I still ask those questions every day. The lesson from Paul's sermon in Athens isn't just that we can be too easily distracted by the tangible and intangible idols that, that often stand in as an experience of the divine. But that by our very nature, we have been created in the image of a God who longs to know us, who crafted within our DNA a desire to know God, perhaps saying, I'll look for you, God. Some young adults use a fairly new word of the English vocabulary, and I like using it, called adulting. It's often called, it's often hashtag adulting. Some sayings from this idea of adulting are, so it turns out being an adult is mostly Googling how to do stuff. Hashtag adulting. Or that hor horrifying moment when you are looking for an adult and you realize you are an adult. <laughs> so you start looking for an adultier adult. Hashtag adulting. It refers to the skills and responsibilities of claiming responsibility for your own life. Like learning to iron, paying bills, and even creating a budget, or realizing that binging on whole TV seasons, as fun as that is, at a time probably can't be the only thing you do on weekends. Or like learning when the low air pressure light on the car comes on, you should do something about it. While I hope I have a handle on most of these skills, I'm always working on them, on the big questions, how to be the person God calls us to be, how to be human in an often inhuman world, we are all adults. We need a teacher. 
one who can show us what we are for. And Jesus is that revelation. I think that is why I don't want to hear more. When you know you don't have all the answers, when you know that you haven't fully matured, when you know that you haven't figured out who to be in every circumstance, and you know that who you are has consequences, you would give anything to have someone give you the truth to show you the way, to give you that wisdom. The more I know about the life of Jesus, the more I want to know about his life. And the more I know about him, the more I understand what I am for. I think that is why I said, we will hear you about this again. So I don't know what will happen this week, uh, but it is likely that in the world, we will see moments when the world could benefit from having some adults, some folks who demonstrate spiritual maturity. And it's possible that you stumble a bit this week. I hope not, but it's possible. And if you do, come back next Sunday. We'll be here, and we pray the Spirit will be here to teach us again, or remind us what we are for. Now, it will be a judgment of sorts, but it also be welcome, gracious. Amen. Mm -hmm. Our next hymn is hymn number 319. Spirit, please stand as we sing. Thank you. 
We thank you for opportunities to be with our families this, uh, this summer. And also, now that we've started school, Lord, we pray for the school year for all the students, all the parents, all those that are involved in the education process, for the teachers, uh, for the administrators, the, the support staff, all those who are involved in the buildings and um, transportation. We pray for the buses, uh, for the entire system. We are so grateful for our education system. We pray for safety for all involved, for inspiration, uh, for the ways that uh, many of us have been um, and have benefited from the education and the socialization and the different ways that we grew up and matured in, in, in the school. We pray that for the students that are doing that now and that they may be able to uh, enjoy and get out of this education all the things that they need and, and want and to make it enjoyable. So we thank you for that. We pray for that, not just for our community, but the communities around us and the communities in our country and around the world. Um, thank you. We also want to lift up any and all prayer requests we haven't heard out loud in those situations, even as we think about those now or have emotions that go along with situations. We pray that we might be able to present these before you to see what we're in those lives and in those situations and relationships and in our own as we do this. Thank you that we can come to you as a congregation together, uh, as individuals in our own quiet times and also as families. Uh, and we pray that we might be able to uh, have the courage to speak in those situations when you give us the words or just to be in those situations. Uh, thank you for your spirit and your spirit go before us into those areas. Lord, we also want to pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As part of our worship service, we also have the offering of tithes and gifts. Uh, the usher will come forward, and during this time of listening to the offertory, let us offer ourselves to God. <laughs> Kingdom that we do. 
Thank you for your work in our lives that we might be able to see your work going through us and into the communities and people around us. Thank you for all that you do. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 288, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Thank <laughs> you. 